Okay, this is Art131 with Wyndham Graves, and I have Andy Seibel here with me um, today to talk about theater and specifically about people moving in theater. Uh, Andy, if you'd introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Andy Seibel. I've been an actor, director, choreographer, playwright, jack of all trades in the performance arts, and I currently teach at Auburn University of Montgomery. I get to freelance on occasion throughout the Southeast, most recently at the Alabama Shakespeare Festival. Awesome. Um, and I think that we want to get this kicked off with a few definitions, uh, just because this is for a general audience that may not have uh, much knowledge of how theater works, because I am definitely a general audience person when it comes to theater. Um, All good. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so the first thing hey, that I... we need audience. So, yes. you know, that's a crucial part. Without audience, you're just doing things by yourself. Yeah, that's weird. Um, the, I think the first thing, and I think one thing that I was thinking of when I, when I was coming up or when I was working on this was the definition, where do you draw the line between theater and dance performance? Well, theater uses visual, but it's traditionally it's been the text so it's been an auditory experience you would go to the to hear the theater back mm -hmm. in the day whereas dance you would go to see the theater now when we're talking about greek theater they blended the two and it actually came out of song and dance in the western mm -hmm. philosophy or the western theory and the western evolution of performance and theater and performance so the idea is that with dance it's a primary primarily visual medium through movement and theater is definitely with text and voice okay so it's that inclusion of text and voice that kicks it over into theater sure but the cool thing about the evolution of the performing arts now is you get these multidisciplinary pieces mm -hmm. that are dance theater or movement theater that really cross into the lines of what we would traditionally think of as as theater or dance which is really wonderful but when you look at it it's really happening all over in all of our disciplines as far as sampling and and taking things from this genre and moving it into another oh yeah i think everybody's seeing that and everybody's trying to figure out how to deal with it in their own way right um and i think another thing that people are pretty aware of is is musicals um and i don't think that those are in there i think those are probably a separate thing or some like to the left category um, well yeah musicals are well, again if you're going back to the traditional that that idea of singing and dance and poetry that that has been there from the get-go in the western okay. tradition i talk about that a lot but it still was there as well in the african traditions as well as the the eastern traditions chinese opera so music and theater and ritual and dance have have consistently been twined together throughout our history as a species so that kind of sounds like the the fact that we call musicals musicals as separate from the rest of theater is a more new invention yeah it's i mean the idea of using music in theater and using dance in theater has been around for a long time but the we're getting into semantics of what makes the american musical because we, we mm -hmm. do call that the the american musical and it is a it has a, a different set of rules than European opera or Chinese opera. So that's where that delineation came from as far as musical theater goes. Okay, cool. Before we move on, would you mind um, giving us a little bit of what makes American musicals so different and so specifically defined versus more traditional stuff, um, especially European opera? Yeah, so with European opera, in an opera, everything is sung. Even the stuff that is recitative is still, it has a, a melody underneath of it that goes musically and rhythmically. In musical theater, you have the blending of book and song. So you have that transition between speaking and then singing or mm -hmm. speaking and dance. The, the evolution, early musicals, the song and dance had nothing to do with the plot back in the, the teens and the 20s. And, um, and it wasn't until much later a little bit later, not much later in the grand scheme of things, came pretty short and quick. But for people living in the time, it seemed to happen over a period of, of decades that the plot had to be connected into the song and the dance. So that that's a more recent development in the grand scheme of things. 
and that's kind of what we see today that that sounds when i'm when i think of musicals that's kind of what i think of right when you're thinking of the big musicals like uh the color purple and um trying to think of what's come through recently cats. anything the book of mormon yeah, no well of cats of is a different thing altogether okay <laughs> cats, we'll is, cats is based on a is based on a a a loose plot line, but it was based on a book of poems and poetry. And so it's, it really runs into the idea of a musical review. And a musical review is, is when you take a bunch of songs and, or song and dance numbers and stick them together thematically, but not necessarily with a plot line, not with characters that are recurring and developing. Uh, okay. Well, that, that's yeah. cool. That's definitely a new thing for me. Um, now, in that same way, you said that that was a collection of essentially sung poems and things like that, or mm -hmm. a collection of songs that are put together thematically. Thematically. Does that yeah. happen in non-musical theater? Um, in well, yeah, I, there is some avant-garde stuff that's being done with poetry that's non-linear in plot, absolutely. But it's not necessarily musical theater as we would think of musical theater. No, no, yeah, I was just wondering if that same sort of uh, review collection style happened in the other kinds of theater. I assume it happens in dance quite often. Oh yeah, you'll go when you see a concert. You'll see an evening of dance, but but all of the pieces they don't all make what we would consider a ballet. And ballet as a general term, as in the traditional ballets used to have plot lines that were based on myths and stories. Okay, so that so, is a narrative structure. Correct. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, whereas you look at contemporary or modern dance. Um, and by modern, I mean, you know, stuff that was showing up in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. uh, that's movement for movement's sake, where you had smaller pieces of choreography that weren't necessarily plot driven or character driven or storytelling or narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk about ballet, I think of a very specific thing in my head of a specific kind of movement, specific kind of costumes, um, specific stage even. Um, yeah. But you used it more as a term describing the structure of the dance. Is that used in other kinds of dance? Do you still call it a, a ballet? Yeah, or, absolutely. I mean, weird. The irony okay. is, is we will we will call this the ballet, and sometimes we say it with you know tongue firmly planted in cheek. But okay. When you're doing, yeah, I use that term in in theater all the time, where I say, oh, this this piece of movement structure. Because I do a lot of multidisciplinary stuff with my own work, mm -hmm. with my my personal creative work, not stuff that I'm interpreting from another artist, but like stuff that comes from me. Mm -hmm. And I always have I love blending movement and poetry and dance and social dance as well as as abstract movement mm -hmm. to create narrative or storytelling or just to express something. And uh, I'll I'll say that all the time. I'm like, okay, now we're gonna do the cell phone ballet uh, or whatever, <laughs> awesome. you know. Yeah. Okay, well, that's cool to, to know that that word's a little more useful than just, you know, pink outfits and <laughs> leaping about the place. Um, yeah, and even if you look at contemporary ballet now, it looks nothing like what we consider the traditional ballet yes. of the 17, 1800s, which ironically was built out of, most people don't know this, but ballet actually came out of the sword work, the positions of the feet positions in ballet that everybody knows, first, mm -hmm. second, third. Those, those are actually, those are actually fencing uh, resting positions really <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah amazing. came from the french court yeah oh, the french, dance okay. yeah. also yeah the 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 fencing master was also the about the ballet teacher which ballet means you know dance yep. ballet that's so cool say. i did not know that crazy stuff huh <laughs> yeah now i'm trying to History. think of what those feet positions <laughs> look like and that kind of makes some sense <laughs> yeah you google them and you're like oh wow yeah. except you know for a modern for any sort of modern sword player or you know, fighter or mm -hmm. fencer, they're like, yeah, no, because <laughs> <laughs> there's they've been so they've evolved so much. They're so different from what they were back in the day. Yeah, I imagine yeah. that that when you start from a similar point to what two hundred and fifty years ago, about now. Um, oh yeah, I don't least. even know. That's math. I'm not good at math. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, when you like start that. at that and each and each evolves separately, you're going to get some pretty different stuff by this point. Absolutely. Um, so, what we're talking about just the, well, just theater and definitions in general. Um, I think most people kind of look at theater as this like 
I don't even know how to say it. Like a uh, like versus movies and TV theater is this like strange uncle that lives in the woods. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, Wouldn't it be more appropriate to say it's that strange uncle who lives in the big city? <laughs> yeah, actually, you're probably right. But yes, <laughs> yes, you're completely uh, correct. <laughs> Although ironically, people act out all the time, so yeah. there there is still theater all over. And the, oh, yeah. the other cool thing about it is it's it's it is the cheapest and most affordable. All you have to do is is that old adage. I got a barn. You don't even need a barn. You yeah. can have it a backyard and make up a play and put it on. Real yeah. easy. So why why do you, well? I think one thing in general. Why do you think that theater? is seen as this kind of separate thing um and it doesn't have the support that say movies or tv do um and there's some good economic reasons i can imagine for those yeah um but also why did you pick it then well strangely for me i feel like it picked me but i'll get to that in a little bit um the the when you ask why i think a lot of it has to do with exposure Mm -hmm. Uh, theater for the longest time was the the art of the people. It was very easy to get to. And with technology and cinema, for economic reasons, what you're saying is exactly true, that suddenly films were much easier to get to. They were much more affordable to get to. Mm-hmm. Professional, you know, yeah. that, that were done by professionals, people who dedicated their lives to this craft. And I think that's where the transition went over. Um, mm mm-hmm. Yeah, but the the difference and most people, they are just inherently different. There's something vastly exciting and thrilling when you're experiencing good theater. And, and good theater is experienced. It's not watched. You experience it. Mm-hmm. And sharing the actual space with the person is really, really incredible. I love film. I, I really do. Uh, it's a much different thing to be in. Mm-hmm. When you're doing film, you're so focused on the storytelling rather than your relationship to the audience. And in theater, you're telling the story, but you're also paying attention to the audience and taking them on the journey with you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really like the 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 the, the, the description. Um, Do you think it is about that interaction? Because I'm thinking of like um, in theaters that I've been in and this is probably my, my limited experience with it but it seems to me like it'd be very difficult for the for the um actors to read the audience and kind of engage in that way that like when i think of being a teacher like i'm constantly watching my students faces to see if they're understanding the things that i'm saying whether i need to go over it again and stuff like that um are there spaces that are set up specifically for that kind of more interactive stuff or are you talking about just these very fleeting um grabs of interaction yeah so there's two things that were there's there this is actually two two topics of discussion cool. one is interactive theater which is actually not what i was talking about but okay. that's a really really cool thing where the audience truly is a part of they are on the stage they're in some cases choosing the plot line or choosing which characters they choose to follow and those kinds of things that is really really exciting and you can't do that with film okay well i will make sure that we get back to that yeah the other thing is um that I was talking about is just the fact that when you're in, when you are on stage, you are on stage working through a scene with your, your scene partners who are up there and you're telling the story, but Mm -hmm. you're also paying attention. I think a good actor is paying attention to just to, to make sure that the audience is with you. And it's a weird thing that you develop over time that you develop over experience that, you have a sense of where they are. You're not looking at them. You are listening, but you're not, you you have an awareness of them, but there's not a direct focus to the audience. Because once you do that, then it breaks things. Unless, of course, on the flip side, see, this is the joy of theater. There's always, there's always exceptions to quote unquote rules, which is why I call them tools, not rules. Um, There are direct addresses to the audience where, and this is classical and Shakespeare Mm -hmm. in, in, Moliere, you know, all these classical theater genres that you would look to the audience and directly address them. That I, if I were speaking to the audience, I would, I would speak directly to you. Mm-hmm. 
also not necessarily what I'm talking about. It's just the idea of paying attention and, and knowing down in your gut, are they with us? Are they not? Are they bored? What's going on? Are they just quiet because they're listening? Are they reacting? You know, yeah, it sounds all kinds of things. It sounds a lot on. like um, what we would refer to in in just general social situations as people who can and can't read a room. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of just being aware of the energy in the space and working with right. that. Um, and because you have a reason, you're telling the story. You know, you have yes. a vested interest. Oh, yeah. You can't you can't go through three, four, five weeks of rehearsal and be doing a show eight shows a week. You know, mm-hmm. picking up, closing this town, going to the next town, and doing it over and over and over again without having that connection to the people and connection to the piece and why? Why do you want to tell this mm-hmm. story that's on stage? Uh, one thing I wanted to cover real quick before we moved on. Um, you said that those, there were those direct when the person talks to the people in the audience, and I, I think in um, in movies that's called breaking the fourth wall. Is mm-hmm. that the sa- is that called the same thing in theater? Yeah, it's actually a theatrical term. Okay. The fourth wall came about in the, I believe it was the 1800s. I'm not a theater historian. Okay. That's so fine. I don't I don't know exact dates and all that kind of stuff. But the the idea of the fourth wall came with this the creation of a set design and scenic design where they would the play would take place in a single room and it was as if that room was an actual room and they the they just took away the fourth wall to the room. Mm-hmm. Typically, a wall has a room has four walls, and they would just take away that fourth wall, so that you were looking in on this slice of reality. Kind of like happening what we would you. think of as a sitcom stage, right? Yeah, or a box set. Yep. Um, not not the box set where you get all the series, but then a box <laughs> design. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Okay, so so I think that like probably the most famous movie or one of the more famous movies that's done that recently is probably Deadpool did the breaking the fourth wall thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And again, that's been around for a long time. The yeah. roots of cinema are in two structures. They're in art for the picture, mm-hmm. right? But also in the narrative, which is storytelling, i.e. Mm-hmm. theater. So it's the combination of moving pictures because that's what they originally were, were just images. And then when you started adding, they were images that created storylines. Mm-hmm. And then when you started with the talkies, adding in text, adding in the voices of the actors, and then it became more theatrical, pulling from, pulling even more from a theatrical concept. So. Yeah, it, it is... <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it is so interesting to see early uh, movies and how close they are to theater, and you can just watch them kind <laughs> yeah. of break, or you can watch them just very slowly step away from theater. Um, oh, absolutely! And then every once in a while, it seems that it comes back for a little while. You get a really theatrical film. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And even today, the things that people are doing to make film more special, for example, they're bringing mm-hmm. the live experience into films. Mm-hmm. When they did Harry Potter, they did the last Harry Potter film up in Birmingham, and the orchestra played along with the underscore. Oh, that's awesome! It was it was incredible because you're experiencing the music in a totally different way with live musicians while you're watching this film. So it's a, it's a real meta experience, and most of us don't get to experience a big Broadway musical with a huge orchestra pit. yeah but a lot of those big classical musicals were written and it's a totally different feel when you've got you know a 32 piece orchestra underneath that pit and singers singing with it yeah that's, that's a different amazing. it's just a, a visceral experience because you feel that music you feel the vibration in your it literally in your body mm-hmm. that's so cool uh, cool. Yeah, we um, last Halloween we went and saw um, the Count of Cogliost, Count of Cogliostro, whatever that old movie is. Um, but there was a live band doing music to it, and it was really cool. It's yeah. a really neat experience. That's the mix of those two things working so well together. Yeah, 
Um, and I love that. You'll see also you'll see a lot of of theater and dance. They're now using mixed medium and digital media mm -hmm. and cinematic and aspects of of new technology that are coming in and being used in the storytelling in the experiential process of the uh -huh. expression i saw a really great piece that was in virginia last year that had a, a, a dancer and she was looping herself through a live feed mm -hmm. and so it was a constant loop after loop after loop of the choreography Oh, that's super cool. It, it was really, really cool and, and interesting. And then she was reacting in real time with a loop of what had happened prior. So it was it was wicked, wicked fun. Yeah, I imagine wicked that would fun. be... I just went to Boston for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. But. Yeah, that seems like a good reason to do it. Um, yeah, that that's interesting. And I'm going to take a little detour here because I think it's, it's important to just stick on this topic of... of of theater and movies and things like that. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that theater shows, especially in, in places like theme parks that are doing it like many times a day for very large mm -hmm. audiences, um, will oftentimes have a camera and then that's playing at, on a screen. Um, you also see it when people are doing speeches or, or at uh, church services and things like that. Um, yeah have you incorporated something like that or, or what are your feelings about that well when you're playing big big spaces and that goes back to want to see they want to see up close and personal mm -hmm. and we get that from cinema i mean don't get me wrong the close-up is crucial to a film mm -hmm. and we want that feeling which was why i think that those theaters who can afford to do smaller spaces are actually really finding a lot of profitability out of the proximity and closeness because there is something exciting for example if you're at the alabama shakespeare festival and you're going to see something like buzz and you're watching these film actors that people know i mean it was really fun for me to watch the audience watch the watch the play oh, because they were recognizing they're like oh that's so and so and oh that's so and so and and oh the director is is in the audience and she's right behind us and she's this you know very famous actress and it was it was just awesome. really exciting to see that that proximity and real time to real people rather than the distance that we get from from cinema and the distance in cinema and film film and television but film mostly is what i'm talking about is great in one respect because it allows the buy in to be that much more uh. facile mhm mm it's easier to buy into this as a story, you know, oh, I'm seeing it dreamlike or I'm, this is, this is the movie that this really happened or this is happening. Whereas in theater, there's always that aspect of, we have to buy into it. We know that this is not real. Like mm -hmm. this story is being enacted for us. Yeah. And that's that there's something really romantic. There's also something incredibly dangerous as we all, as we do know far too many cinematic actors who, get lost into those roles and get lost into those worlds and end up yeah well i think there's also plenty of viewers who do the same no uh, yeah 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 um and fantasy is sexy but it can also be very dangerous <laughs> yeah oh yeah yes and for that exact reason yeah uh-huh um, exactly yeah anything that's that engaging may be too engaging mm -hmm. um so when you do your shows, have you used that personally? I, I have used, I have used digital media. I, I definitely use digital in my last solo show, mm -hmm. but not in the respect of what you're thinking. I, that piece, I wanted it to be very much in a, in a real tight, confined sort of digital media aspect. So all of the characters were speaking through digital media whether mm -hmm. it was a newscaster or ironically it was a teacher who was who was experiencing a flipped classroom so he's talking to his classes online was another character in that show oh that's a little um, too real man I, I know right it's a little like prophetic it's a little scary uh <laughs> and um and then the younger the younger generation where of course they were using their phones and how the texting i i used a lot of text bubbles in that I guess that piece is several years old. Gosh, wow, time flies. But um, 
yeah, that, so I was definitely using it in those pieces. I've used film as an opener for a play that mm -hmm. I directed that was not my creative work, but it was appropriate for that piece because it was all about the piece that the play itself was about a, a film crew that came into this tiny Irish town. So I wanted to have this idea of how powerful cinema was to rural areas when famous people come in and take over a small rural space. Okay, and one last question about theater sure. and movies before we can just drop back into theater and leave movies and TV alone for a little while. Um, Sarah wanted me to ask this question. Uh, why is it so hard for Broadway plays to become movies? Like, it makes sense to me why a book doesn't make a great movie because it's just too long. But why do Broadway plays convert so poorly? <sighs> Hmm. Sorry for such a hard. We can go back to it if you want. No, that's okay. I, but I mean, I'm. Yeah. Because when you think about movie musicals that are doing well, ironically, they're pulling a lot of pop culture. Mm -hmm. uh, or they're anime. Yeah. You know, they're animated. Those do extremely well. Mm -hmm. But as far as. I think that when something has been created is well the transition to go from a book per se to a musical is also a massive transition mm -hmm. and a lot of things get lost in that sometimes they do really really well sometimes they don't mm -hmm. but I think that the challenge of making a musical is that you really have to buy in very quickly to the reality of the world of musical theater, which is harder to do cinematically. Oh, that's interesting. I think that the ones that are more successful is the Rocket Man, the Elton John biopic that just came out recently. Mm -hmm. Very stylized, very much like a music. Mm -hmm. But that first opening, they get you, like the, they really get you in that opening aspect. But they also reference so much music videos in that mm -hmm. film that that's what catapults that. And we're so used to seeing mini musicals. Well, my generation is, yeah. um, certainly. Uh, we're so used to seeing mini musicals on, in that MTV format. <laughs> it's yes. definitely showing the age there. But it's that whole music video format. So we're used to that aspect. And again, it makes it an easier jump when we take a popular culture figure such as Elton John or Freddie Mercury, who we know in that vein, versus this this story. Which ones are you thinking of that specifically so the one we talked yeah. about earlier of cats being insane and weird? Oh well, I mean, you know, cats—they called it the big litter box on Broadway for years and years. Um, <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I personally like cats because my mom read those poems to me, and I saw that when I was in high school, and I was like, "This is cool." Uh, I was like, "I know these words. I didn't know this was a musical, whatever." But I had no expectations, and I think when people come in and they have a expectations because it has no plot. I mean, hmm. it does. It has a very loosely thrown together, wackadoo plot. You know, yeah. that's. But it's, but yeah, that was, I mean, that's, that one was destined to be a. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think <laughs> I mean, of what. I just, I don't know. I don't know how they got. Well, and like well, for, for they had a older lot of money. ones, there's things like Jesus Christ Superstar that didn't mm -hmm. really fly as a movie, but are pretty good plays. Yeah. I don't know about Jesus Christ Superstar in the box office, but Hair certainly did very well as a yes. musical film. So it, it really depends on. I mean, some of them do well, some mm -hmm. of them do not. Um, and then the flip side is, you know, you have movie musicals that they're turning into to Broadway musicals. Moulin Rouge was... Mm -hmm. was well, Disney, I think, does a bunch of their stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, all the Disney stuff is yeah definitely a, a musical. <laughs> sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's like, whoo, missed the boat on that one. Um, yeah. But that's that's the that's the joy of being an artist, right? You're you so rarely knock it out of the 
Yeah. Um, and even when it fails, it fails miserably, wonderfully, spectacularly. Yeah, such the, as the the Spider Man musical. The failures what don't a fizzle. Failure. Yeah, no, that sucker went out with a bang. Um, <laughs> literally for the poor actor playing Spider Man, but yeah. Um, yeah. But those are, and that's that's the same thing. I worked with this incredible artistic director, and he said he he gave me this analogy back in the day that he, now he was doing it for subscriptions, but I moved it forward to me just as an art form in itself but he said the key to getting subscribers to buy into your theater is to let them know that the theater season is like a baseball season or a basketball season or a football season you have some games each each play is like a game you win some you lose some but you stay with your team and you look at the overall season and did the season do well do you know and that's one of the things that you're looking at huh i look at it as this way is like it's kind of the same way but like if you go in you you create this one okay i i spent a year of my life working on this for two years or however many working on this creative piece and yeah it was great and i i got all these accolades and i made some it or b it was like yeah it was it was all right it wasn't that great but yeah. it, i mean but i did something yeah you know or better or, and this is the weird thing it took me years to get into this mindset or better yet you fail so that you you really have to reassess and go, what happened? Was I so, or do I still believe in this piece? And and I just don't understand why. You know, you really have to like figure out like what is your. You really have to reassess what is your relationship to the art form and to the necessity to do it and create, and what makes you a creative person as opposed to a purely interpretive person. Man, questioning yourself as a creative person that's got to be a rough show. <laughs> oh, but it's necessary. <laughs> It takes a lot of guts to be an artist, any kind of artist. Oh, yeah. It does, because you're constantly putting your stuff out there to be judged and, and put on display mm -hmm. in a way that the average civilian doesn't have. No. You know? And um, theater people, theater, film, uh, actors, all of us, we're, we're constantly doing doing job interviews. I mean, we do, yep. in, a, in a good week, we have three job interviews in a week, four, five, Same. you know. Um, it's insane, but you know, that's the reality of the situation. Ugh. Um, now, right now, everybody's hurting. Like, yeah, I can imagine. Uh, as far as theater goes, but most people, because you know, they have other things that they're falling back on. They're doing all kinds of other jobs. Mm -hmm. Theater people are survivors, so they're they're going to stick around. Yeah. Um, you said something I found really interesting in that the the whole baseball season thing or the sports season thing compared to a season of theater, and uh -huh. one thing I it just popped into my mind. I'd never even considered that as a concept. And um, one thing I find really interesting with that is one of my favorite things about older movies, uh, especially like the cult classic style movies is that there will be actors who are now famous and you can see oh, yeah. them in these other strange things. And I almost wonder the value of that in the theatrical setting of like seeing your local actors uh, and actresses in these roles that even if they're, even if it doesn't work quite right, it's still interesting to see that person deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just fun. It's also fun yeah. just to, to go and watch people. And, and I love watching young actors because young actors tend to be where the, where the careers are yet to be made. Mm -hmm. But I also love the, I love, love, love. I was watching. Now my brain is going to give out on me, but that's fine. I went and saw a play and I thought, man, that actor is fantastic. Like, why is she not huge? A woman in her probably mid fifties. And then the next thing, you know, I am like watching Netflix and there she is. And I was just like, what? <laughs> yeah. So that made me very, very excited. And I do love regional theater actors on a lot of Netflix series and, and mm -hmm. things showing up in places that, that give them a bit more, cultural validation yeah uh the one of the worst things is, you know people are going like oh well you know are you gonna make it big are you gonna be a big are you gonna be a movie star and there there are plenty of ways to make a living in this field even as a performer and a director and make a nice living without being a superstar yeah so at that point i usually ask oh are you gonna be a ceo of the company <laughs> 
why not? <laughs> it's like, oh, you're going into business, so you're going to be a fortune. They're like, that's not realistic. I was like, oh, oh touche. <laughs> Yeah, it's so. I always get on some kids about being super famous artists. I'm like, well, no, not everybody plays for the NFL. Uh, sometimes that's just not going to happen for us. Yeah. Sometimes you you play for the minor leagues, and you got to be in it for the. Love. Yeah. Man, if you're not. It will, I, because the whole fame thing too is a whole another ball game. I'm with enough famous people to actually count my blessings, that I never hit it that big. Um, yeah. That is a whole absolute nutty lifestyle change and i am far too too private of a person to have to deal with that that would drive me a little crazy it would drive me a lot crazy definitely but it's exciting i mean at the same time it's exciting to share a stage with that person with those people who have that kind of credentials and oh i bet yeah and and it's got to be just it has to um be that thing where where it forces or encourages you to you know put on a little bit more effort to meet them yeah but no oh really (laughs) i mean no yeah you just do you do your gig i mean if you're if you're like bumping it up just because you're on with a star then why are you what are you doing are you like slacking off when you're doing it with you know with somebody who's not a star yeah because i've worked with people who are i mean we we have some amazing actors right here in Alabama mm-hmm. at that Alabama Shakespeare Festival. Uh, I'm I'm gonna name a name. I usually don't do this, but Greta Lambert is one of the top actors in this country, hands down. Mm-hmm. Very few people know her. Yep. You know, I do not. Uh, but she's. I mean, I'm telling you, she is fantastic and just really, really phenomenal. And if I ever get to share a stage with her again, I'm my blessings uh she's just a wonderful human being and a great actor but if i'm going to be on stage with her i'm not gonna i'm certainly not gonna slack off Mm -hmm. no way i mean because i guess to me she's you know she's she's a huge star yeah she's and she's also i mean i'm very very lucky to also call her a friend and a colleague and the thing to remember is that these stars are the same way like they are just they are there to make a film or to do this play or to tell this story. Now, when you're doing film, it's a totally different ball game because if they're a star and they're carrying the, film, ugh, or if you're doing a Broadway show with them, now I've not done Broadway show with a star, but um, the same sort of thing that their name is that selling point. So there's a lot more pressure when you're the person on there. Yeah. And imagine. you hear all the stories. Um, you really hear all the stories about the great people they they never let their understudy go on because they're like yeah people people came here to see me do this show so yeah. i have to do this show eight shows a week could you imagine do you you came all the way to new york to see blank and blank and then blank's not there for that day it's like yeah. they, they take my guts and rightfully so and then you get other people who you know quote unquote stars who just don't care they're like yeah whatever tough yeah. luck kid sometimes <laughs> you're like Bastards. i really appreciate <laughs> being able to make work and put it on the wall and not have to be there again <laughs> yeah for you guys who are you know painters and sculptors and and two-dimensional artists that you get to create the art the art is the artifact and then you leave it yep. you're lucky sons of bitches <laughs> 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 but at the same time you don't have that that the there's art a... itself that's the joy of theater is it's so ephemeral you oh, do it and then it's gone i was about to say film there's you not do the... film and it's still there but yeah there's not the joy gone. of performance of doing it Dude. the shared space yeah. the shared experience yeah most artists are whiling away in a little cave by themselves um <laughs> or out partying i don't know partying, a lot of yeah. a lot of the artists that i know are here. yeah well, there's so. a little bit of, a little bit of column a a little bit of column b exactly yeah, yeah. um so while we're, we're on the topic of like having to love it because there's no other reason to be doing it um I think an interesting thing for me is that dancing specifically, there's dancing for doing it, and then there's dancing for viewing, which is most of the stuff that you're doing. Um, And then on that same topic, 
why participatory acting isn't as popular as dancing. Like, you go to a wedding and dance. You don't go to a wedding and act. There oh, are... but people do act all the time. You think about those speeches that people give at weddings? Mm-hmm. We, we have quote-unquote theater. I mean, people are acting out all the time. But not, per, but not for prescribed <laughs> narratives. Right, but then people don't dance for the same purpose. Social dancing is not the same purpose in social dance as it is per, for performative purposes. Okay, let's go into that a little bit. Yeah. So social dancing, when you when you go out, you hear, ah, oh, this is my jam, and you go out and you dance, and you jam mm-hmm. on the Right? That's a different kind of experiential being when mm-hmm. you go to a club and you're going to dance, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's a that's a different aspect of of dancing. Whereas when you go to see a performance of dance, mm-hmm. you as an audience member have an expectation that one, there's going to be a sense of expertise from these dancers, mm-hmm. you know that it's going to have some sort of choreographic purpose Mm -hmm. when we see it we're either going to be in awe of the technique uh and i love all kinds of dance i I love dance i wish i was a better dancer if i'd have been a better dancer i'd have been a a far less prestigious actor because (laughs) i love to dance but i was not man i was not that good um i mean i was just good enough to get in but but yeah i i I love it and I love watching it. So everything from street dance to to classical dance to contemporary dance to modern to all the ethnic dances and the religious dances, the the, the East Indian and African dance that are done from for either social purposes or religious purposes or mm-hmm. for performative purposes, all of that is fantastic. But going back to my point, when you go to see dance, you have an idea that choreographically, this is this choreography is going to say something mm. to me. Either, he's either going to express an emotional aspect, a thematic idea. It's going to pull together a, a visual element, or a, it's going to have a narrative storyline, or there's going to be something about this movement that I'm watching. Mm-hmm. And and I have a certain expectation that that depending on what level I'm going to see, that there's going to be a level of mastery and skill set, right? Yeah. That's the, that the average person is not able to do, right? Mm-hmm. And now from the, um, so from the, the, the dance theater perspective, we've talked about it from the audience members seeing something that is clean, professional, tight. Mm-hmm. Um, but from the, from your perspective, from the person doing that, how does that feel different than the social? So when you're doing something that's performed, unless you're specifically doing improvisational mm-hmm. dance, then the, the pr- it is a production. I mean, mm-hmm. it is rehearsed. You know it is the lighting, the other scenic and design elements have been addressed in this production to make the spectacle of the production gel together with the the basics of choreography and dancers moving in space. Mm -hmm. Okay. As opposed to, so when I'm doing that, and there's also a service to the, to, to the audience when Mm -hmm. I go on as a dancer or if I'm a choreographer or whoever I am on stage, whether it be active or dance, that there's a service to the audience that I, I owe them something, right? Oh, I awesome. owe them my best that I can do in this storytelling, in this movement at that given time, right? Because they, they opted to come here and, and give me their time to watch me do this. Mm-hmm. In social dance, yeah, that yeah. is all out the door. I have no responsibility to you. My expre- my, when I move for myself, then I move for myself, you mm-hmm. know? I move because I'm moving with these beautiful people who are out here moving with me and we're listening to this music and we're experiencing it together and it's it's creating rhythm and movement in our bodies and we're enjoying that and we're enjoying the proximity to this beautiful body next to me and this beautiful human being next to me and this, you know, yep. beautiful being behind and in front. And then, <laughs> you know, whether it's a DJ or a live band, you know, we have the musicians and it's that interchange Whereas it's not a directive, it's not a production, it's meant to be truly experienced rather than watched. 
it's not prescriptive in any way right but i really want to get to this whole idea that that we don't act like yes, that because, let's, let's i mean go into anybody that. who's ever been to a club or anybody who knows like the worst place to find your mate is at a bar because <laughs> nobody is acting like themselves at a club or a bar indeed that shows your age more than anything it's now on the internet everybody just finds their mates on the internet no i'm not talking about hookups <laughs> I'm not talking about hookups. I'm talking about and and you know people going out to go dancing, people going out to go to a club, to go to music, to to go dance. Mm-hmm. And you can't tell me that generationally that 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 age is not doing it because I can tell you it is. Oh no, I know they are. <laughs> they are, and they they may not admit it, but they're they're looking for love. They may think they're too cool and sophisticated, and they're going to find it on you know whatever site is is hip and hop happening these days. <laughs> Anyway. And yes, I am. I am old enough to say, "Children, go love." Yep. Um, so you were talking about how how you you didn't like the fact that I said that we don't act socially, um, and I want to... in a in a way that we don't dance socially. Yeah, like if we go dance socially, we go watch dancing, but we think of acting as something we go watch. We don't think of acting as something that we do, and I think the thing that keeps it away. F- for me, at least when I when I was you know coming up with these questions and thinking about it, was that when I think of acting, I think of like kind of putting on the mask, but it's not mm-hmm. prescriptive in the same way that like reading from a script is. Right. Um, so so can you go into a little bit of how you do think it is the thing? So there's two aspects of what we're talking about mm-hmm. as far as community theater, right? Which mm-hmm. you do it for the the process of of creating community, mm-hmm. right? The experience of we're putting on this play, you're going to come see it as your your friends and family. It's not a professional production. You're you know that you're coming to see this to see your your neighbors, friends and family put on the play. Okay, that's one aspect. And that could be as simple and small as like people doing stupid stuff for YouTube or TikTok as long as it's planned ahead. Yeah. Of, yeah. That's exactly what people are doing. I mean, all these YouTubers or you know who who are on here and I mean, reality TV, people are actors who have no training because reality TV yeah. is scripted. Yeah. I mean, people should know that, that it is scripted and that people are told exactly what to do. It's not even real people. They're not even allowed to do the things that they want to do mm-hmm. on there. Like you are told, OK, you're going to go over there. And you're going to start with her. Well, start a fight with her. Well, why would I start a fight with her? Because that's what people want to see. Yeah. It was like, I can't do that. I can't do that. And then literally, I'm, I'm actually speaking from experience because I had a student who was doing really well. And I was actually pretty proud of her. But she was on a, a reality TV show and she came back and I said, why did you get sent home? And she said, because I wouldn't go over and, and yank this girl's hair out. Oh, literally, they told her to go yank, yank, yank out her fall. Oh. And she's like, I can't do that. She's like, she's like, I go home. Like, I got a whole family. Like, I can't can't do that she's, she's like it's like no way i got a community go home they would be horrified if i represented yes my small town in alabama that way so i was really proud of her but you know she missed her chance but i was really i was really grateful that she didn't didn't fall into this trap of yeah. people behaving poorly and badly for the the lowest aspect of our cultural mm-hmm. ideology it's horrifying <laughs> and there I am showing my age, but I really don't care. No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> but I don't think I am because I, I think that a lot of young people feel that way too. I talk to my students and I really appreciate and enjoy them. And I really appreciate their perspective of how they see the world. And a lot of them are, now some of them are like, oh yeah, that's great. And I was like, yeah, but do you really want your girlfriend or boyfriend acting like that? Do you really want no. your friend acting like that? And they're like, oh God, no, I dropped that motherfucker. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> you know, I dropped that person like that. Yep. Uh, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah. So, so why are you supporting this horrible? Because you are, you have power as an audience member. I think that's the one thing that we forget as an audience member, we have power where yeah. we choose to spend our money, where we choose more importantly to spend our time. Yes. Time that is so much is more of a thing everything. nowadays. Yeah. And so if you choose to, wa- to and I'm going to say it, if you choose to waste it on mindless 
mindless reality TV that does not make you better as a human being. It only goes to your lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. You are making a choice about the world that you want to live in. Yep. You want to live in a world that people act the fool. Well, and also and, now, uh, because metrics can be taken so specifically, the more those things are watched, the more they're going to be made. Yeah, exactly. No. And so you are contributing to the to the problems of our of our culture. You are actively contributing. That's not not even like oh you're just not doing anything. No, you actively if you if you choose to watch those things, you are actively contributing. And as a as an actor and as a trained actor, when reality TV came on, what people didn't realize was that everybody wants their chance to be famous, but yeah. not everybody wants to do the work to be a trained actor. Yeah. And so you get these yahoos who are here. They're they're literally taking contracts because they're taking screen time away to do these reality TV shows from paid actors, people who have gone to college to learn how to do this craft, how to be a film actor. Do you know? Anyway, that's I do have strong feelings about that. Freely admit. That's fine. Yeah, and I I think they're they're good, probably good feelings to have for a lot of a lot of reasons. Um, yeah, I'm so passionate about the country. I, I really, I've, I've, I've traveled many places around the world, and I, I've lived in all four time zones, all three coasts in the United States. Yeah, I guess we have five time zones. So I forget Hawaii and Alaska, but yeah. uh, I really, I really do. I'm very passionate about this country. I'm very passionate about the young people. I'm very excited about the stuff that they're doing. There's a lot. There's a lot to be learned from them. Oh yeah. There's a lot to be learned. I will tell. I, I I will say the one thing that I tell my students now is like, stop sampling. Come up with your own stuff. Stop sampling. Like, what do you have to say? Like, well, stop taking my generation stuff and rehashing it because that was. I mean, that was a long ass time ago, y'all. Like, I I, I, I just try to keep thing. the resampling down to about twenty five percent. Oh man! If one in four things are resampled, that's fine. So I reduce, yeah, um, yeah. But it's just easy. It's it's an easy way out, and it's not creative, and it's not you know, it's 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 just saying that you really don't have anything to offer when you're just sampling. Yeah, I'm like oh yeah, I might make you popular for the moment. Yeah, but you're not you know, but you're not making anything that somebody twenty years from now will take and reuse. Yeah, you're not going to say you're not going to do something that that's well i shouldn't say that because it might change somebody's life but i doubt it <laughs> yeah that sounds judgy guess what it is you're allowed to be judgy that's that's the one nice thing about the arts is that we can judge each other mercilessly constantly um one thing i think that that a, a good way to come off of this and not talk about reality tv anymore um Excellent. is um Please. When I think of theater, I'm thinking of very specifically, like, per step, defined plans. You say these lines, you go over here, you say these lines, you go over there, you, you know, strike this person, you say those lines, and then everybody breaks into song. Um, versus, like, what, when I'm coming up with art, with, um, art pieces, I'm very much doing it on, like, an outline. Like, it's not that tightly prescribed. Um when you are writing or directing or what other word that I'm not aware of, whenever you're doing those acts, um, how specific do you get? Well, first of all, writing and directing are two different things. Yes. Two very different things. Yeah. And then it, this also goes back into the idea of what is the script that you're working So are let's you working start with, with the script that's... writing. Okay. So if you are working with a script that that has not been created, then typically I love directing these things, but if I'm writing, then I'm working with a dramaturg and I'm working with, a lot of times I'm working with a director when I'm writing a what script. What does a dramaturg do? A uh, dramaturg is the person who's the literary expert on, on the production or the play. They're the person who takes a look at thematically we have a conversation of like, what, what, what are my goals with this? Uh, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses of this script? What's not working? What's gelling? What's, you know, what research do I need to do? What's legit? What am I totally off the base with? 
they're that the outside set of eyes looking in objectively to the work that I'm doing rather so, as I'm coming from my work from a very subjective position. You know, I have opinions about it because I tell this story. In a literary sense, they would be just a super involved editor, it sounds like. Yeah, along those lines, okay. an editor and a researcher. OK, cool. A helpful set of eyes like that. Yeah. And then the director, of course, is the person who's helping you look at like, OK, well, how are we going to stage this? <clears throat> Like, how are we going to get it off of a page in your head and onto an actual performance platform, mm -hmm. whatever that might be? So when I'm working with that, then, and I, and I direct a lot of new plays. So that's the difference. When you're working with new plays, you do a lot of readings. But even when you're doing, a, even when you've, you've done your readings, and let's say you're working on a week for readings, that you are in the room with a bunch of actors a director, a dramaturg, a playwright, and you're you're talking through the script from mm. every aspect as possible, that from the the real specific character to character, which is the actor's job, to the overall looking at it as the director, and then from the dramaturgical viewpoint as well as the playwright. So you've got all these voices that are working to streamline, to to assist, to help with the storytelling. So that's an aspect that or readings and then at the end of that you do a reading of just the text mm -hmm. um, no no spectacle no costumes nothing it's just the words and the people that's all you're doing that's a pretty typical and then and then it's much like you know when you go in you have an idea of what you want, but you're figuring out what your process is and that's the creative process different than the interpretive so once you've got that play and you've got that script and you have that text, then the next step, of course, is taking it into production. And so when you go into production, then you're bringing in your designers and your design team and like, how am I going to transfer this idea from the page into an actual scenic design? So your original yeah. written script no. doesn't, that your original written script does not have like stage direction in it. Um, yes and no. Typically, I also teach, in Virginia at a at a at an MFA playwriting program and what we tell our students is that try to use as few stage directions okay uh, if you want something to be kept then a character has to say it huh that's an interesting the way character. to put it yeah i like yeah. that because because a director is not allowed to touch what characters say really no, a director is not allowed to cut a line. They're not allowed to cut a line. They're not player I ask permission. Now, interesting. The the design elements, those are suggestions. Mm -hmm. But you're not allowed to touch what the characters say. So if you, as a playwright, what I tell my my young playwrights is that if you don't want me to fix this issue that you've created, then you've got to make sure that the characters reference reference yeah. it somehow you know if you want this to be set in antarctica you better have like you better be talking about the ice and the snow <laughs> and you yeah. know those kinds of things why um why are character lines seen as um so sacred like in the <clears throat> visual arts the there's there's no i don't know for me there's no real value difference between an, an image a symbol a color or, or, the, or the words that are being involved they're all the same if you want them you want them if you don't you don't well when i say that that certain things are like certain things that are written in thematically if it's necessarily if it's necessary to the plot and it, it's thematic then that is that is also sacred because it's mm. really changing the the changing the storyline is changing the story of the playwright. okay okay so just remembering that the playwright is the creative owner of the text uh -huh. and that's that's the important thing but if a playwright says they cross down stage a lot of that is left over from back in the day where where the published script which is what most people are used to reading uh -huh. is actually the script that was published from the first production. So someone would write in, you know, he walks away. So that's already also, turned through all these processes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We and were... on the flip side, but you also have, you also have these 
to to will let you know exactly what a character is feeling. Um, and that's all legit too. You have to take that into effect. How you're going to stage that or how you're going to bring that up is like, I don't know. Um, Pearl Clegg is an amazing playwright. She's one of my favorites right now. Mm-hmm. And um, Pearl Clegg, she's Pearl. an Atlanta-based playwright. C-L-E-A-G-E. Fantastic playwright. Love her. Um, and she's a lovely human being as well. So, but her Blues for an Alabama Sky, which had its Broadway, um, it was like, Felicia Rashad did the did the show and everything. It was, it was really, really, you know, high end. Um, but at the end, if you're reading the script, it has literally a novel passage that you would find in a literary book that is like how the actor feels and everything. And, and I was just reading this was like, wow, that's 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 a lot. Because basically all you're staging is a sitting at the window looking out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's you know so it's um but she she does give you that assistance and that evocative feeling of how she as the playwright wants that play to end and then you as the director you have a you know you you have a, a responsibility to the playwright and a responsibility to the text as well so no so even though that's not like the written word you you should still, I think you should still honor the ending. Now, so help me with this. If I'm the director of this thing, I have this play I've started with, I have these actors or I'm acquiring actors. Um, I have all these things. Am I acting as a um, go between for the, for the text and for the actors or am I, what am I doing there? Am I just mixing it all together and hoping it works? Like what, in what order are these things? Well, happening? hopefully you're coming in with a little bit better idea of why you wanted to do this project and what you want to do with it. So the, the director is the person who is in charge of marrying all the things together in order okay. to create the production. The director is in charge of making sure that you are talking through your process and your goals, what do you want to achieve with this production with your design team so that your costumer, your your costume designer, your scenic designer, your lighting designer, your sound designers, all those people are creating the same feeling and coming up with the same idea that, that will gel together so that when you put those costumes on that actor, that light on that actor in that costume and when that actor moves to this soundtrack that's coming in or these sound effects or whatever that all those things gel together to create the feeling that you want to have when an audience experiences that production and those moments in the production okay that sounds it sounds like what i would expect i like that yeah um is there are there any other people in that process that that of the planning of the thing that that you want to talk about? Is there anybody I'm missing? I mean, yeah, there's tons of people. So there's <laughs> there's I mean, it's a, it really is a team. It really really is. Even if it's a solo, it's a, you got all the you for just to have one person on stage. But there's a lot of specialty. So if you're doing a dialect piece, you want to have some sort of dialect coach. If you want to have, um, if there's uh, uh, any fights or anything like that, you have a fight choreographer. If there's any dancing, you have a dance choreographer. You have the dramaturg, like I was saying, I love dramaturgs, they're, they're overlooked far too often, um, but they are there. There's the thing now that's becoming more and more popular, which is called an intimacy coach. So anytime there's any sort of sexuality on stage, there's somebody there to think about that process and think about um, how, how that intimacy is going to be created and what the rules are and what the rules are. Um, there's also, I mean, on the flip side too, you've also got production. You've got your your people who are in charge of taking that scenic design and building it. You've got your producer who's in charge of coming up with the money to make sure that everybody gets paid. You've got your house the people who are in charge of the building making sure that everything is going the way that it's supposed to be going the institution where you're working at if it's a nonprofit theater which is in line with producer um, producers tend to be a for-profit term and mm-hmm. nonprofit tend to be executive directors or artistic directors oh that's um, an interesting so, yeah. split yeah so that's kind of how that is if you see here artistic director, executive 
director for a nonprofit theater like the Alabama Shakespeare Festival. They are the producer in, uh, in, and, of it, in, and, of it, and um, in and of effects, especially the executive director here. Okay. Uh, the artistic director is the one who's in charge of seeing like the creative aspect of the theater. So when the when those two are split, <clears throat> then the artistic director is the one who's in charge of choosing the season and making sure that has the overall look of like choosing the directors who will direct this play and those kinds of things. Just, oh, okay. What's the programming going to be like? What they're what doing a higher things. level strategy and programming. Right. Okay, that's cool. Is yeah. there anybody else that we missed in the planning? Um, well, certainly stage manager, who is the glue of everything. <laughs> I mean, the stage manager is everything. The stage manager is worth their weight in platinum. And the cool thing about the stage manager is the only one who lives through both aspects of pre-production, which is all your pre-production stuff, mm -hmm. the rehearsal process, Mm -hmm. And then once you open the show, a lot of people leave, you know, your designers are gone, like your, your, your carpenters and your scenic people and your painters, they're finished, they're moving on to their next project. Yeah. So the people who are actually staying with that production are the actors, your wardrobe, um, trying to think of your, your stage crew, your deck crew, mm -hmm. those folks, and the stage manager is the one who's who's doing that with them now your stage crew doesn't come in until we're ready to actually put the show on the stage and we have a thing we call technical rehearsal which is where we go out of the studio and into the theater and you start layering in all the aspects yeah. so you you layer in your sound you layer in your your lighting you layer in your your scenic elements um your props whatever things that you didn't have before rehearsal street so the, the the stage manager is the one who pulls all of that together, and I swear to God, they are working. <laughs> there are always those people in the world that just keep it all moving forward. Yeah, they are truly the unsung hero. They are the first ones there, the last one to leave. You never see them because they're always at the back of the theater. Yep, um, they're up in the booth. They're the guys wearing they, the headphones, right? right, right absolutely. The okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, and you get your board ops too. I forgot. Those are the. <laughs> Okay, so now. So yeah, there's a ton of people, and I know. I'm... I now it, it. Let me let, let's apologize. Just say, I'm an actor in this thing that that we've just discussed, and we've just gotten to this play now. Uh huh. It sounds very much like I'm being acted upon, not so much acting. Um, what creative freedom do I have with all of this huge waterfall of stuff happening ahead of time? A lot, but yours is more. Yours is much more specific. Okay. Then, As an actor, then, our creativity is in for yeah. our interpretation. Give me the, of the limits character. of that creativity. I'd rather focus on what the possibilities are. Perfect. Because that's a semantic. It's real easy to, to, to get caught into that idea. That is really damaging. Because the, okay. the, the worst thing that you want is to lose your confidence as an actor. Oh, that is yeah. truly the worst thing that you could ever do as an actor is lose your confidence. So what you focus on is, okay, well, who is this person? How do they walk? How do they talk? What's the trajectory of their story? How do they contribute to the story? How do they, you know, where is their turning point? What did they learn from the beginning to the end? What's their arc? What's their change? Um, you look at, like, in this moment, what, what is my relationship to this person overall? What is it in this moment? Why is this moment important? Why is this moment even in the play? Do you know, is this the setup for this moment? Is climactic moment mm -hmm. those are the things that you're looking at you want a relationship to the the other person you at i said that already but you want to look at why you say what you say mm -hmm. why how you craft this moment because as an actor you look at the play overall and you look at your character who you are what do you want and then you start breaking it down into your scenes and then, well, you break it down into acts, and then you break acts down into scenes, and then you break down scenes into beats, and then beats get break down into moments. And so you're really thinking about the whole trajectory of this story in really tiny, tiny increments, at the same time juggling the overall picture, because you know you've got to go from A to D. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of creativity that comes from that. No, you don't, I mean, you don't get to choose your clothing, yeah. but... 
the thing that's cool about this is though that clothing begins to inform you and how you're going to move or it also includes informs the psychology when you're like, oh yeah. wow, that's really flashy. I did not think of this guy as a really flashy dresser. So if he's a flashy dresser, what? Why? Why is he? Why is he wearing this yellow and white striped jacket when everybody else is in in creams? I'm like, okay, so so why? What's what's what is the purpose behind that? And and how does this affect the way that people are looking at him or how he wants people to look at them? at him do you know like those kinds of things so it's just it's it's all information and and it has a lot to do with having respect for the other people who are bringing their elements to the storytelling because Mm -hmm. i'm a firm believer we are all better if we're all throwing the best that we can knowing that we're part of a team and respecting my teammates Mm -hmm. contributions you know as a designer designers see things love designers as a director and as an actor because they see things in a different perspective which is brilliant and informative and wonderful and fantastic and it's just really exciting to see like what are they going to come up with yeah and again you you have to 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 choose the people that you want to work with and choose how you work with people that you don't necessarily want to work with yeah. because sometimes you get to choose your team and sometimes you don't yeah but the reality is, is that you've got to respect these people as individuals and are an in and of themselves, and you need to do this project. Sometimes it's brilliant and wonderful, and remember those times, and you're incredibly grateful. And sometimes everybody's great except one person, and you all commiserate, like one person, why, why, why? But so what? You know, it's only one project. Yeah. The thing is, is that theater, like everything, is ephemeral. You're only working on a project for a couple of months at a time, and then you're moving on to something else. So now, as an actor, you've you've just described this really complex set of, of of things and like knowing how a character moves from the beginning to the end of a play and being able to work within that and have that inform your acting. Um, and you said that that some of these people are doing this eight times a week for, I imagine, mm-hmm. quite a few weeks in a row. Um, that first performance has to be different than the last, and. I feel like it's kind of one of those things where when you watch a TV show through or you watch a movie through and you kind of know the hook, you know the ending, then you watch it a second time and it uh, feels different. Mm -hmm. Do you allow that to inform your acting or is that something that you you try to push against or is there, does it depend on the play? Well, yeah, things settle in. And that's the term that we use, you know, Mm, production settles. So it tightened, it should tighten, hopefully. Uh, but a lot of times when you're in a show for a long period of time, a director will come back and say, okay, we're going to go back into rehearsal. Or we're going to take out comments that you made. <laughs> yep. Then, you know, you're in trouble. <laughs> then, you know, it's like, uh, and yeah, it kind of went off the hooks. There. Okay. Um, yeah. Those kinds of things. I've only been in that situation once, but it was, thankfully it wasn't me, but it was not a fun rehearsal. I can imagine. Um, the, yeah, it was a Romeo and Juliet, and they started making the they started making comic choices in it. And it was like bad, and this was a really professional production. Oh Ooh, no, it's not pretty in that dressing room. When the director came back, yeah, ouch, yeah, that 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 sounds yeah, rough. Yeah. Um, now, so we've talked about this very specifically planned um, sort of setup. How? How often do these things start as outlines, or do they, or do they all pretty much start as this very prescribed, stepwise ma- uh, manner? Like, are there ever times where a writer says, "Hey, I have this idea. Let's put some actors on stage and just see what they do with it," or is that just not done? I won't say that it's not done, but theater in and of itself is an expensive proposition. Oh, so, so the expense very... of throwing the actors on stage keeps you from doing that. Right. Okay. Because you have to think about it. I mean, when you're dealing with professionals, that's a livable wage that you you have to come up with for a weekly salary. Yeah. So the production end of it kind of negates that, which is why you're seeing more and more shows being tried out off of of outside of Broadway before they go to Broadway. Because that takes care of all that production stuff. Right. Ah, It's cheaper to do it. It's cheaper to do it where 
it's cheaper to do it and f fix the fixes and see how the audiences react mm -hmm. than if you're just going to open it on Broadway and try and fix it there. Yeah. Because then it's too expensive and you get reviewed immediately. People are like, this stinks. And you're SOL. So, and that show closes and you've lost millions of dollars Oof. because it takes millions of dollars to put up a Broadway show now. I imagine it's all, all everything it takes to make a movie minus the cameras. Um, yeah. yeah. It's not as expensive as a film. No, no, no. It's um, not as expensive as But on the flip side, it's not as lucrative as a film either. Correct. And you keep having to pay people to keep doing it. Right. Because <laughs> in film, you go into production, you pay everybody, you're done. Right? Yep. Except for royalties. But even royalties are starting to disappear. Um, mm -hmm. But... In theater, you open the show, and that's just it. You know, now you're open, and you're still paying those folks. Yep. So, yeah, it's a different ball game. But that's um, another reason why film pays more than theater does. Yeah, because you only have to pay it once. Right. Yeah. Or you only get paid once, depending on your perspective. Um, well, you get paid weekly. Why well, not? On film, for however, however many weeks you're going to be on the production. So, for um, if you're SAG. I should say it's not a um, it's not a continuous gig for the actor. Right. Afterwards, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So I think one thing that's really interesting uh, that I think a lot of people like about theater and movies and music as well is changing actors in the same role. Like there's a certain sort of delight in seeing how a different person's going to handle the same role. And I mean, in, in music, this happens with covers all the time. You get really great covers of songs that sometimes are better than the original. Um, how do you feel about, about, changing, about changing actors for roles? And can you give me some examples of ones that are just like, this is your favorite actor in that role? Hopefully people that we might know. Oh, man. Um, well, of course, I love it in theater. I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. Uh, trying to think, man, who... So before you get to that, um, when, when you enjoy doing it in theater, have when you guys go out and you um, audition people for these roles, mm -hmm. you have something that's in your head. How often do you get what you had in your head before you started auditions? <laughs> and how often are you just like, oh, this person just knocked it out of the park in some way I was totally unexpecting? Well, yeah, that's that's something I talk about students all the time. When you're coming into audition as an actor, I want you. The last thing I want to do is sit through. I, when American Idol came out, I did not want to watch it because of all these really talent free people, and I just did not want to watch another bad audition. Yeah, because it's horrifying when you have to do that. So just know that as if there are actors listening, man, we just want you to just knock our socks off. We want you to be great. Uh, Ooh, man but, but now is it the best the case scenario way? is that you have an idea i try not to think of how i want people to look okay more so than how i want them to make me feel i want to know what that actor what effect their presence has on me oh okay. rather than like you know i want i want to be really drawn to this human being or i want to i want to trust this person and want to be able to to feel like i can really confide in this character okay so I, that's how i try and define because then then you don't get stuck in the these god awful stereotype casting of like oh i have to go for a look yeah and then then you're stuck because you know looks are only skin deep if you have this this beautiful human being you know this what a quote unquote you know what we think of this classic um, you know, small nose, you know, mm -hmm. full lipped woman who comes in with, you know, uh, you know, decent bust size, small waist, <laughs> larger hips, you know, that kind of bullshit. Uh -huh. And then you're stuck, you know, you're looking for that rather than thinking like, well, I, this woman needs to make me feel like I, I just adore her. Like I want to yeah. like fall at her feet. And that's how I need to feel. And then I get this um, case in point, one of my favorite actors, who's not really an actor anymore, but she's six foot one. She's a gorgeous character. She's you know got these long, beautiful, 
dark hair and these really strong features. I mean, she's exotic. Um, that's kind of sounds racist, but uh, uh, she's just got these really um, strong, strong, like no, and um, what they would call the quote-unquote Roman nose. and um, But she just has not what you're thinking about your traditional mm-hmm. beauty. But when you see her, you're just like, oh my, stop, please. Just can the world just stop right now? <laughs> um, and if you're stuck in this whole idea of like, you know, supposed to be this kind of pretty, demure, leading lady type um then you then you get stuck. Yeah, that's not going to fly for that role. You know, that's an interesting yeah. way to look at it. Is is picking it how it makes you feel versus versus the aesthetic or or kind of role that we would consider. Well, I am. If if you've seen my productions and if you've seen, most people know my personal work has to deal with social justice issues, mm-hmm. and so I am really adamant about diversity and inclusion and casting so i really don't want to get stuck in any sort of ethnic racial um uh, religious tropes you know that that you get stuck where like oh this character has to be so and so no that character doesn't have to be anything other than that character needs to make me feel this as an audience and make this other actor and any actor work that they're solved can fall in love with anybody can hate anybody can betray anybody can befriend anybody i mean that's our job as actors is to pull those aspects of our real lives and put them onto any other character in order to tell that story that's a a really interesting way to look at it and I, i like that that is both very simple and it gets the job done like those are the best kinds of rules the simple ones yeah. that still get it done. I love those. Which is, it's, I mean, again, just treating everybody with dignity and respect and, yeah. and knowing that everybody's doing their best to contribute to this, this story and everybody who's coming in the door wants to be involved in this project for some reason. Or so, mm-hmm. you know, and just respecting whatever it is, wherever it is that comes from. And also the other thing we talk about too is that when you're casting, the hardest thing to remember if you don't get this one or you may not be quote unquote right for this project at this right time, you're still auditioning for future projects. Yeah. Because there are people that I am still like, I still want to work with this person so bad. Yeah. Because they're a great, great actor or a great designer or a great whatever, what have you. Yeah. But actors get hit more so than, um, than the design and tech because the visual aspect of who we are is such a huge part of storytelling. Yeah. I imagine that's a little rough sometimes for new people, especially. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, so we, we, we've been talking about people that have these really heavy duty identities and kind of um, you picking this exact right person for this individual role. Um, How do you handle picking people who are the rest of the cast like people who are backup dancers or same way or what oh really okay yeah absolutely because every if a person is on stage they're there for ah yes the character is there they serve a function otherwise they shouldn't be there hmm okay yeah that's really looking at if that role is not if that role is not serving so you got to look at every single role. Every single role has a purpose. Every single role is important. Yeah. Hmm. Even your your chorus, your ensemble, because the ensemble as a whole. And so, okay, when you look at that and you take it apart, it's like what what is what are the feels that I need from this ensemble of people? What do they uh, need to do? Well, in this number, they're this, 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 this. So then you start looking at. Uh, who do I have to put in the forefront in this number versus yeah. this number? And are they malleable? Can I get all those feelings from them? Yeah. You know? So instead of that individual feeling, you're looking for an aggregate or average feeling and piecing that together from the people available. Yeah. Who's malleable. And, and a, a good chorus actor is really underrated hmm. because it's such a balance to be able to transfer. Um, you know, if you're looking at a, a a musical where you go from low class in the streets, you know, gutter snipes to 
the next scene where you're at a very fancy dinner party, black tie, ball gowns. Then you're at a racetrack and you're a, a mix of, of different folk. Yeah. Um, that that's that's a big thing. And then you also have to yeah, the the talent that goes into transforming yourself characters yeah. quickly and seamlessly and the different dance styles. And I mean it, it's a hard work to it's a takes a lot of time in the studio learning to be a Broadway dancer. So it's, it's years. It's a lot of years. It's, 10 years to be a dancer, 10 years to be a singer, 10 years to be an actor. Good Lord. Yeah. Yeah. That's insane. A truly professional. Um, who's, who really understands the craft and can maintain eight shows a week. Yeah. That, that's a heavy duty workload work. there. Yeah. Especially when you're looking at uh, shows that are really long. Yeah. Those are, those are brutal. Things like, friend of mine just did angels in america that was up a couple years ago i guess it closed about two years ago now but that show was long <laughs> long it was brilliant i mean it was fantastic I, I, but it really was brilliant i don't use that word that often but i guess i do uh but in respects to an actual production this one was fantastic but it was long <laughs> it yep. was three Three and a half hours. Oh, geez, that would be rough to sit yeah. through. Much less. Yeah, it have. was. Mm -hmm. um, and they were exhausted, uh, but they were wonderful. But then you hear all these stories of these these singers who are doing these Broadway musicals, and they don't speak during the day. Yeah, they have to save their voice. Because they have to save their voice for eight shows a week. Oh, that's insane. That's so crazy. Again, I'm so glad that my work can just go into the world, and I don't have to think about it much. Mm -hmm. Um. Step, stepping back a little bit, um, how do you, like, when I think of planning movement, the first thing that pops into my head, even though I don't care about football at all, is the little, like, football play sheet thing. How do you guys plan <laughs> movement on a stage? So are you... Like, do you draw it out, or do you just tell people, or what? staging, or are you talking about choreographed movement? Let's do both. Let's start with let's start with just like uh, somebody's doing Shakespeare and you need people to stand across from each other. How do you tell them how to get there? Okay, so I like to sketch. I take this the stage and I, I look at what's the picture that I need in this moment. Mm -hmm. What's the what's the visual story that I want to? So somewhat like a storyboard I... from a movie, maybe a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I love I love doing as a way of creating visual picture, because again, that's, that's the basics. That's, that's goes back to the history of theater and creating the visual mm -hmm. imagery. What okay. is the visual element of the storytelling? Right. And so that's the way that I look at movement. But then I, I also, then you, again, you look at like, this is the basics of what this is like. And then you look at moment to moment. Uh huh. How are you going to create tension? What is the tension that needs to be created? What's the conflict that needs to come clear to the audience? What's the what's the proximity of the characters? You know, what what are the levels that we're dealing with? The height, mm -hmm. the height ratio. Is one seated? Is one standing? Are they on the floor? Is it an intimate scene? Is it a is it a battle scene? Is it you know what's 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 the gist of the scene? So yeah. you think about that, and then you sketch it out rough. I sketch it out rough and then I go put the actors on stage and I try to give them a freedom okay. because they'll understand, they yeah. understand what a character's going through. I like anchor points okay, so that I know we have this visual image here, but anywhere in between here is fair game, but you know, you got to get to this somewhere in this line or two or three or four or five you know, depending on how things roll. Yeah. And it also depends on the expertise of the actor. Okay. So if you're working on... with newer actors, you would give more direction? Yes and no. And as soon as I say it, it depends expertise <laughs> because some actors like to be told. Okay. So there's also so a preference it... thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that's just your, your basics of being a director and knowing who you're working with and how they like to work and take care of them. 
mm-hmm. make sure that they feel feel like they are getting the support and help that they need with their best performance for. Okay. And now let's go to um, the choreography, whether it be, you know, dance choreography or fight choreography. The, those two things seem much like they require much more specificity. Uh, how are those things planned out? Are, is there is there some language that's used to define steps, or is it visually planned, or is there a set of symbols? Um, there are all different kinds of ways to create choreography, and there are as many different processes as choreographers. So, some choreographers work from gut gut instinct, and they just start with it. And some have a very defined, precise way. They have a formula. Mm-hmm. There, there's just so many ways to create movement that but will be like, let, like let, let's say your choreographer is in California and they're sending you your choreography. What does that look like? Well, is it a so my choreographer wouldn't? I wouldn't choose to work that way. Well, yeah, yeah, but my choreography push comes to it. shove. We're all quarantined. You need to dance from home. How are you getting that information? Oh, uh, so this is really atypical. Okay. And so the typical way is that I have conversations with my choreographer mm-hmm. in that in the pre-production, we're talking about what, how does this number function in the storytelling? What's the feeling that we should be getting from? It? Okay. How does it build into this to the trajectory of the plot? How does it build into the trajectory of the development of the characters? Mm-hmm. What's what's the feeling when you hear this music? What are you getting? What are the images that you see? And you just have that conversation until you find that spot. And then, you know, you, you bring about the other design elements of what are the costumes going to be like in this number? Mm-hmm. What are the we know the musical ele- elements because we can hear that. What's but lighting, you know, where where are we thinking with this? And a lot of that, again, has to go with feel and atmosphere and tone. So when you when you were in your casting, the is every bit as important in casting a musical as the director themselves. Yeah. Because they have to know that can that actor, can that those yeah. chorus actors dance the choreography that we need to have. Okay, so... And so when you I'm... go to audition for a chorus, you know, it's just, it literally is like chorus line. You learn a choreography and they you dance it in front of them and you sing your 16 bars and and um, typically for, for musical theater, you don't do a mic. You just sing and dance and that's it. Uh, um, so then so... getting into the idea of the choreographer, choreographer who comes up with that sketch of what the movie is like, and then you have that conversation when you see it and checking you go see you're like okay well how's the number looking you look at it yeah and i think i might just be asking a stupid question or i might be asking it poorly but um or i might just not be understanding how this stuff gets from place to place um uh, but like if i'm making a if i'm making a a, a, re- a, re- a recipe there's a list of ingredients and then there's a list of instructions what does that look like for dance oh so annotation of dance. yes, yes there's yes. a couple different there's there are several different ways and again a lot of people will do um, a lot of people will do different ways but now honestly the thing that we use most is digital we videotape it oh that makes sense and that's how you annotate it so the dancers are just learning from a like looking at somebody and copying yeah well that's how that's how we teach it the choreographer teaches it and in real time you know traditionally choreographers in the space choreographer is just like the director so there's it, not it a so there's not a like written set of symbols that indicate no. step stepwise movements. Okay, okay, yeah, that's what I was. No, about. I mean there are, there are those things, but we don't use them. Yeah, I mean it's just much easier to teach in real time and say okay, um, okay five, six, that makes good seven, sense. eight, step, yeah. step, shuffle, kick, ball, change. You know. That kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, well, that's cool. Uh, yeah, it was just it's it's so interesting that something we take almost for granted can't be taught in the way that a lot of the other things that we teach people or the, a lot of the other ways we transfer information mm-hmm. it really does require being taught in person that's very cool yeah that means just culturally that's where we, <clears throat> that's where it all came from and that's where that's cool still lives okay so i think 
one thing we, we talked about a little bit about the the difference between movies and theater before and i want to get back to just one concept just because we're talking about actors and acting and doing all this stuff live um performing unrecorded versus recorded uh do you find that people are just much more calm about doing it because they know it's not going on a on a recording or are people more worried about it because they don't have a second chance um all of or, the above all the above <laughs> how, how yeah. do you feel about doing unrecorded performance doing unrecorded yeah yeah we're, See, we're that, just your normal typical. yeah yeah that's that's a normal eight okay. show a week <laughs> day so again it's but, but you it don't you don't feel like out. weird that this stuff's not being saved for posterity Oh man, yeah. But see, most people do archive, which is there is an a... archive somewhere, but okay. it's not a, a great, a, a great. It's just a a, a medium level yeah. production on the video, okay? Right, exactly. It's just a, a still shot of the, the stage and the you're. Oh, okay. Now so... I did do one for PBS. I did a a movie musical of the Lewis and Clark, board, and that was fascinating. Oh my god, I gotta yeah. go find that. That was fascinating. I have a copy. I can. Awesome. <laughs> Where is it? Well, the thing that's so funny is it got so edited, massive, long, long musical, and they edited so much that it kind of didn't make sense when it hit the. Oh no. When they televised it, yeah, they took a three-hour musical and made it to like an hour and like it, it was hard to follow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it is what, it is. and um, yeah, but that. Uh, but that was really, really fascinating because we did the show with a live audience and we recorded it with cameras multiple, multiple times. So that was that was wild. And what they did was they took the footage from they recorded seven performances mm -hmm. or something like that. It was it was an extraordinary amount. Because when you think of the the time and the money that went into it, but but yeah, it was fascinating. It was fascinating to do it because you became really aware of the crane, the camera on the crane coming oh, yeah. around in a way that I had never, <laughs> I just never experienced that. that was vastly entertaining. Yeah, I kind of liked awesome. it. <laughs> <laughs> Those cranes are cool. Uh... Yeah. Okay, so a few other things that I have notes on from, from earlier. Um, you wanted to, or I, I would like you actually, to talk a little bit more about interactive theater because it's something I've not heard much about and I've not participated in before. Um, would you give us a little rundown of what interactive theater is? And um, I assume it's an up and coming thing since I've not heard about it or what? No, it's been around for a long, I mean, it's been around for a minute, but there's, there's, several different kinds of interactive theater. One of my favorites is site specific. And so you go on site to a place that has a historical mm -hmm. reference or has something or, or it's site specific. The play was built around this, this site or this information. And a lot of them, well, yeah, there's, there's all different ways that you can go about creating that interaction between audience and performers. Some of my favorites are where the, the characters break off and go into different rooms and then reconverge for big scenes. So you follow the characters that you want to follow. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. So that's you can cool. go back multiple times and see several different shows because I'm following this character. I have no idea what happened scene over here. Like I have no idea. Um, there are other interactive ones where you just follow, just follow the story. You go into like a big church or a warehouse or something along those lines or gardens. Uh -huh. um, and you just follow the characters around. But then there are other ones where the, the audience is pulled and decide a lot of murder mysteries mm -hmm. have that happening where you go in and, and you get to decide how things end. Like oh, who, fun. who choose your own it. adventure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those kinds of things. There's another company that is experiential. What is their name? They're Brazilian, but they did Force Bruta, which, um, and uh, 
De La Guarda, which was uh, two incredible pieces of theater that were, you went in and there were, there were no seats. So you were, you were in the space with them, oh, cool. but they were a lot of aerial acts and they, the fans were on you and they like pulled you around and um, it turned into a massive, massive rave, but you got wet. You were told to, you know, wear clothes that you don't mind getting wet. <laughs> uh, did that you don't mind getting like, you know, things all over them. And I was told, yeah, stuff will get destroyed. So just be aware. So I just wore a crappy shirt. Yeah. Um, so with this interactive incredible. theater thing, um, it, it made me, it just brought to mind. Um, I imagine you get some students who have um, done all the um, live like role-playing stuff. Are those people better at it or worse? Do they like pick up bad habits? I have no idea. Oh. You gotta ask. I mean, I as far ask. as experiential theater goes, I, I haven't yeah. done any of my students. I've I've only watched. Okay. Um, yeah. I want to know now. <laughs> um, I've only something. been an audience for for that. I've done experiential theater in like, you know, when you're hired for somebody hires you in to be a character to work around a dinner party or you know some bougie, uh, you know, fundraising Wait, event for the museum what? or something like that. Huh? What just happened? You get hired in to play a character at a dinner party? Yeah. You gotta explain that word. Like a historic character. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, so you show so up and you know they're they're doing like some you know Gatsby or or they're doing I played yeah it's really weird I played Chopin. Played, <laughs> um, yeah, just like weird characters, you know. But it's good money. Oh. It's theater, but it's not theater in that in the. Bizarre. Yeah. Oh yeah, people. You know, people do anything to stay entertained. But one the the Chopin I did was for an art museum. Oh my god, I feel like we could do a whole show just talking about that. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, industrials are are a lot of bread and money, bread and butter money for for performers. Explain industrial. Industrial is not your traditional setup production. It's more uh, what we would call a business end of theater. Uh huh. So it has a, a businessy aspect to it. You're you're doing. I would do an industrial for the cable company when. Okay. And okay. I see, I see. Yeah, you get hired in, and they they write songs, and you learn these these mm -hmm. spoofs of all these contemporary songs. Um, you know, okay. but it's all done in like an Alice in Wonderland. You're <laughs> doing all this goofy stuff about the cable oh companies, god. and all. oh my you're god, you're basically roasting all their their tv shows at that time they were holding, they had hdtv so you did a whole roast on there was one number that was all roasting hdtv okay it was fun yeah that sounds like making fun. fun of the stars and mimicking them okay so i have two more things yeah. another one from from sarah um what do you think of the celebrities doing shakespeare on various web platforms right now uh and two do you have a favorite so what do i think of them doing shakespeare on are you talking about the one at alabama shakespeare no 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 the ones that like, like people are doing it on like instagram or twitter or like like it's um well it really depends on the individual i haven't watched a lot okay. not gonna lie I, i've been really kind of challenged with so many other things just trying to yeah that i yeah the one thing that i have enjoyed though is a lot of theaters that were closing their shows had the foresight to to record them and they're streaming their productions oh, so you amazing. can actually see those productions so i've been watching a theater in places that in upstate new york and baltimore and and actress theater louisville and kentucky and seeing really really great theater that i would have missed so i I've, I've been watching those oh, that's as far as yeah and that's been one of the cool things that i hope i hope they that might stick around that would be kind of nice because it's really nice to be able to see these productions yeah Some really really good and they're just as good on on i just saw amadeus at syracuse stage and it was fantastic well it sounds kind of like those shows that are um kind of like if you have a nice restaurant in your city but it's not quite nice enough to like drive four hours to get to 
Right. Um, but you still want to see it sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That, that would be really great. Uh, that was cool. I'm going to have to hunt some of those down because so that sounds fun. Um, now, but as far as people doing Shakespeare, it depends on the actor. If I understand what they're saying and I'm moved, excellent. If I don't understand what they're saying, and they're just <laughs> deeing and thouing, I'm like, oh. Okay. <laughs> Okay. My so, favorite is when they do a British accent and then upward. <laughs> old Shakespeare's supposed to be done in a pirate voice anyway. That's my oh, personal opinion. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um So what let, let, let's end this off. What is the best show you've ever seen? What's the best show you've ever been a part of? And if you want to do the worst of each of those things, you can, but you don't have to. Oh, okay. Um, I, I'm going to talk about my favorite, one of my favorite moments. Okay, that works. Because I feel like this is what, because I have so many shows that I love and so many productions that I have just been enthralled with. That it's impossible. But I will say one of those moments that kind of move you and change your life and make you look at the world totally different and what you're doing in the world differently. Mm hmm so there's this company called Deaf West. They're out, and I saw them when I lived out in LA. They do deaf theater, and it's really fascinating and cool, and very accessible to a hearing audience. Mm -hmm. They were really well known because they did the the Deaf West production of Big River, mm -hmm. which is the the Tom Sawyer all that stuff okay uh -huh. big 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 musical and and the way that they did it it was wonderful it was innovative using a lot of of deaf theater constructs and conventions to storytelling so you had speaking audience and you had uh people signing everywhere so it was very very accessible for deaf and hearing audiences but the moment that was incredible the big number that most most musical theater people know is that I am waiting for the light to shine, waiting for the light to shine. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for the light to shine, right? They built all the choreography out of sign language, American Sign Language. And so it was based out of people were signing while they were singing, and then that became the choreography. Uh. They built it, um, and we went through, and you layer in these different characters, because it really starts very small with this one voice and then it layers in other voices and layers in other voices and as it layered people in it got bigger and the choreography got bigger and the visuals got bigger the choreography got bigger then as it modulated it was like i, I am waiting for the light to shine i'm waiting for the light to shine i'm waiting for the light shine i'm waiting for the light to shine i'm waiting for the light to shine and then it cut out completely like not a pin drop but visually everything was still going and got bigger oh that's cool so the visual so so the people who could hear could experience the could experience sound. the way the other people the that's deaf amazing. people in the audience and i was in a huge space it was a big big space out in denver and you could have heard a pin drop I mean, literally, like, it felt like the world stopped. And we all just sat there, like, and we went. I, I, I mean, I remember vividly the woman who was, like, several down from me went. <gasps> and then the other beautiful thing was when the, the deaf audience members realized what had happened. Oh, yeah. It was just an incredible moment of shared humanity of the power of what theater can do to make you see and understand another person's journey. And it's one of my absolute favorite moments of all time in theater. So, yeah. yeah. that's amazing. We should just end on that. Screw the rest yeah. of the questions. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. All right, Andy. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me this morning. It's been great. I learned my a lot. My pleasure. I learned. I I now can feel less <laughs> stupid when we talk. Uh, <laughs> well, thanks for inviting me on. And hold yeah. I know I was the easiest person to track down. <laughs> no, nope, you're fine. Yeah. 
Uh, all good. All right. Well, thanks, man. Uh, and I'll talk to you. Later. I'll talk to you later. Bye bye. Okay. Bye.